What's up my D&D family? Today I'm going to be playing The Wolves of Langston Chapter 1. First we talked about how to build a well-rounded character, then we created our character who is Investigator Knapp, the monk. And now we're taking Investigator Knapp on an adventure through The Wolves of Langston. This is the first solo campaign I've ever played, so thank you for joining me on this journey. Now let's jump into it. Chapter 1 the adventure begins. After a long day on the road, you crest a hill and see lights of a town. According to maps and helpful locals you've consulted, this must be Langston. Though the last blush of sunset still colors the sky to the west, lamplight is already visible at the gate and in the streets. In the dim twilight, you can clearly see that the dirt road you've been traveling transitions to cobblestones, and a simple stone wall rings the town. Even from this distance, you can see the timber-framed walls of the building and town are well-maintained with fresh white water that glow golden in the lamplight. It's a beautiful little town, a prosperous trading hub nestled among the fertile farmland and old growth forest you've spent the last few days traversing. The stars are just starting to emerge as the lone howl of a wolf splits the silent off somewhere in the woods. A chorus of responding howls take up the call, some uncomfortably close and getting closer. You pick up your pace to put more distance between you and the wilderness in the hope of a soft bed, a hot meal, and some work for an enterprising adventurer. A town is prosperous as Langston looks like a place to do good, earn coin, and achieve glory. Maybe all three at once, so long as you are eaten by wolves between here and there. Roll a wisdom perception check. If you get 10 or more, go to 23. If you get less than 10, go to 11. All right, first roll of the campaign. Let's do this. All right, we rolled a six. So our first roll of the campaign is a failure, so we are headed to 11. You continue down the road, a growing sense of dread in the pit of your stomach. Looking around you, you see nothing in the trees or undergrowth on either side of the road, even though you feel like you should. You stop Stop walking, pausing to listen to the dark woods around you. Without the sound of your footsteps, you can hear a low rumbling growl and excited panting coming from around you. All around you. A large but scruffy wolf pads into the road in front of you, moonlight shining in its gray fur. Half a dozen more of the beasts step into view, sizing you up. You're surrounded by a pack of hungry wolves. Your odds aren't good, but at least you can go down fighting. Go to 33. You square up to defend yourself as the pack of hungry wolves starts to circle, looking for an opening to attack. There are at least 10 of them, and something tells you more are waiting in the darkness of the trees. It looks like an early end to your adventuring career, but you're determined not to give up without a fight. You're just about to unleash your attacks and go down fighting when you hear a bellow behind you on the road. You turn around to see a bald dwarf dressed in rough spun clothes and animal hides pointing at you from on top of a rise in the road, or maybe past you. Moonlight shines off the skin of his head, his face is lit by small balls of fire dancing in the air over his outstretched palms. Oh no you don't, he yells, the flames flaring with his emotions. Get back, you lot. The wolves immediately tuck their tails between their legs and lay their ears down flat. The apparent leader looks at you and whines. Not a chance, the dwarf scoffs. Go on now. The wolves slink quietly back into the woods, and you realize you are still poised to attack. The the dwarf doesn't seem to notice as he approaches. He eyes you up and down, the silence between you stretches, until it breaks with a massive sneeze. Sorry. You all right? He asks with a lopsided smile and a sniffle. Didn't have a chance to get a piece of you, did they? You let him know that you're all in one piece and thank him for his intervention. Thank you, brother dwarf. Go to four. Well then, lucky for you, I was here, he says with a wide grin and a slap on the back hard enough to throw you off your balance. He opens his mouth to speak again, but nothing comes out until he unleashes a sneeze that makes his beard bristle. You wait for him to regain his composure. You must be hungry then. Go straight down this road and you'll reach the town of Langston. Find the pickled hen, and if anyone asks, tell you Roy Sunderhammer sent you. You stammer out a thank you, despite the adrenaline coursing through you. Think nothing of it. I'm on my way there myself. Funeral, you see. Doing my druidic duty to the city of life and all that. He guffaws as if he just told a joke. But before I do that, I'm going to have a bit of a chat with those naughty pups. They should know better. Before you have a chance to respond, the dwarf lops off towards the woods with a surprisingly graceful gait given his stocky build. Between the darkness and another night on the road, and or a hot meal and a mattress, it's hardly even a decision to head towards the lights of Langston. Go to one. Your hopes for a meal and a friendly conversation are dashed with what you find in the marketplace. More specifically, you're disappointed with what you don't find. It's empty, filled only with a mournful hush. Street vendors are closed, windows are shuttered, lamplighters have still passed through to fill the square with warm pools of light. But everything feels muted under the weight of an oppressive sadness. You're looking around for someone. Anyone. 
when a solitary figure in a white robe bustles out from a side street, nearly dropping a sheaf of papers. The robe's hood is down, so you can see that it's a young woman with light blonde hair. Her robes bear sunburst motifs around the neck and collar, and a similar symbol made of gold hangs from around her neck. This appears to be a sun cleric. So we get to choose, do we call out to the cleric, or do we follow her down the empty streets? Thinking about what Investigator Knapp would do, I think Investigator Knapp would call out before following someone. I don't think he initially suspects anyone of anything. I think he's more the type to let stuff happen first and then figure it out later. I also want to say at this moment that I'm glad that it's also just giving us choices. That it's not always going to be rolling at the end. Sometimes you just get to choose your path. I think that's pretty important for D&D, so I'm glad to see it here. I am going to call out to her, and thus we are going to 27. Uh, excuse Excuse me, miss! The cleric jolts and turns, and you can see a moment of fear as her hand reflexively snaps to her holy symbol. She looks either way down empty streets before breaking out in a wide, kind smile as she approaches. Hello and welcome, she says, her voice high and bright. Can I help you with something, traveler? Where are you going in such a hurry? I'm on my way to perform a young woman's last rites, she says, her kind smile still fixed to her lips. Such a sad day. Are you on your way to the pickled hen? I am, she says with growing uncertainty. Did you know the deceased? I do not, but Roy suggested I go to the pickled hen for lodging. Ah, of course, she says with a sigh. A truly good dwarf, Roy. The funeral will be starting soon, and I must be on my way, but I can show you the way if you'd like. She walks beside you in silence, occasionally consulting the sheets in her hand and reading it to herself. After a few moments of awkwardly accompanying the young cleric, she shows you to an inn whose sign says the pickled hen. The cleric absentmindedly opens the door and steps into the tavern at the ground floor, having clearly forgotten you're even there. She closes it behind her. We get to choose whether to go into the tavern or to look into the tavern via the window. We are hungry, we are sleepy, we're tired, but we're also an investigator. So our investigator side says check it out before going in, but our dwarven side goes in. I'm gonna let this one be a 50-50 roll. If we roll 1 through 10, we'll just go in without looking. 11 through 20 is to go ahead and look in. We get a 17. Our investigator side wins out, so we're going to go ahead and look through that window. We're headed to 19. You find a window to peer into and see a packed room. It's also impossible to guess how many people are inside, but it's at least 100. People seem to be speaking quietly to one another, though everyone seems to have a drink in their hand. You a prowler? Asks a timid voice. You spin on a young barmaid who seems to be throwing away some food scraps. She jumps more than you did as fear pinches her face. No, I'm a traveler and an adventurer. Then you should probably go in, she says with a small smile. The mayor will want a word with you after the service, and the folks of Linkston are a nice bunch, even in the face of so much grief. In life, Mabeline was the nicest person you'd ever meet. She'd want everyone welcome at her funeral. Come on in. Yeah, I could use a drink. So we're gonna head over to 34. The tavern is nearly full to capacity of townspeople milling about, speaking quietly to one another. The hum lacks the boisterous out bursts of laughter or shouts you normally associate with taverns this crowded, and the answer quickly becomes apparent why. At one end of the common room there is a closed casket on a table amidst what looks like hundreds of flower arrangements. A musician is strumming a lyre in a sad tune off in the corner. As you are looking around, an older man is arguing with a huge half-orc woman with an impressive collection of battle scars and a suit tailored in a typical nobleman's style. Seeing you, the man grimaces and sways over to you. He reeks of L and spirits and his face sags in habitual sadness, but his eyes glitter with both tears and an unexpected rage. I don't know you, he slurs, stabbing a blunt finger in the air between you. Was it you? Did you do this? What else have you done? A few heads nearby turn as he throws his hands up into a fighting stance and starts bobbing unsteadily. The half-orc crosses her arms and watches the both of you carefully. You're at a funeral in a strange town, so violence is not an option. You can try to persuade him to leave you alone, go to 41, or intimidate him into backing down. Go to 20. I want to leave a good impression on this new city, so I'm going to go for the persuasive route as opposed to the intimidation route. So we're headed to 41. You raise your open hands and assure the man calmly, Sorry sir, there must be some sort of mistake. I'm just a wary traveler who's gotten men to town just barely. I have nothing to do with this, and we wouldn't want to ruin such a sober event with violence, now would we? Let's roll our persuasion check. If we get 12 or more, which we did with a roll of 15, we go to 2, otherwise we would have gone to 36. So 
to two we go. I actually like how it bounces us around everywhere. It doesn't feel so linear. It feels like you don't know where you're headed and it's probably a good way to keep us from getting spoiled. Very smart design choice. The man calms and walks away muttering about adventurers being up to no good. But he picks up a cup of wine from a tray and busies himself with drinking that instead of fighting you gain inspiration. So how inspiration works in the Wolves of Langston is we get to use it for advantage whenever we like, but we get to save multiple if we so choose. That's an optional rule. I'm going to go ahead and allow it because it seems interesting and I've never done it before, so let's do it. As your would-be attacker walks off, you see that the half-orc who was speaking to him is staring at you. She approaches you. Go to 44. The female half-orc in the tailored suit looks at you, eyes scanning you up and down. I am Tanya Ananathram, mayor of Langston, she says with a nod, her common heavily accented with a guttural orcish twang. I may have use of you. Please stay for the funeral. I will speak to you after. You try to reply, but she is already walking away as the ceremony begins. To 28 we go. A middle-aged human couple gets up and introduces themselves as Maybelline's parents, though from the murmur of sympathy coming from the crowd, that seems well known. Thank you so much for coming out to say goodbye to our darling girl with us, the mother says. She was a ray of sunshine in our lives from the beginning, and we can see she touched the lives of many of you as well. She was relentlessly kind, generous, and patient. We will all miss her dearly. The father of the deceased clears his throat, <clears throat> his eyes glassy. We are so very grateful for the people of Langston. You made our daughter's life a joy, and you're making her loss more bearable, but we will not be seeing you for some time. A murmur runs through the crowd, but he holds up his hands for quiet. Every brick and blade of grass in this town reminds us of what we have lost. Every time we see your kind faces, we will only see the torn and broken body of our treasured daughter. So we will leave and trust our capable mayor to bring the killer to justice. We will keep our peace at home, where we feel the closest to our daughter's memories, but we pray you bring the, the killer to swift justice. As he speak, heads in the crowd turn to the mayor, who just nods to the citizenry. When you turn your attention to the grieving parents, the father's cheeks are wet with tears, but his teeth are gritted in mute rage. Laying a gentle hand on her husband's arm, the deceased mother speaks up. But we are not the only ones to suffer loss, she says in a cracking voice. We had Maybelline for her whole life. The love of her life was cheated out of the rest of it. Tomlin, darling, we'd love it if you could say a few words. The parents of the dead woman step aside, and her fiancé takes their place at the podium go to 32. The man identified as Tomlin is dressed simply, and he clutches a bunch of flowers tightly in one hand. He takes a moment looking out over the crowd, visibly holding back tears. Thank you all so much for coming today, he says with a sigh. We are gathered to remember the beautiful shining light that was my bride-to-be. Before growing to love her, I never thought I was the marrying kind. Now it seems more like fate than a choice. Does that mean the wolf is back on the prowl? Whispers one man near you to a friend. Lock up your sisters and daughters and wives, the friend replies with a sneer. Both are shushed by women who seem to be their wives, both women sharing embarrassed glances. Others nearby in the crowd look over at the pair of would-be comedians with glares and mouthed insults. My darling wife-to-be was a simple soul, he says. Her favorite flowers were daisies. She liked the color lavender. Anything made of silk was the height of sophistication. Despite Tomlin's grief, the two men are still whispering lewdly and sniggering. The women seated beside the would-be comedians glare at them and exchange exasperated looks with one another. Oblivious to what was happening, in front of you, Tomlin closes his eyes to collect himself with a sigh before continuing. To put it simply, Maybelline's death has torn a hole in my life that cannot be filled, but I will try. Work will help, I'm sure, and giving back to all of you who have done so much for me, especially in these dark times, I can only try to repay your kindness. I truly love you all, and you are all welcome at my home at any time. The audience applauds respectfully and murmurs condolences. Right away, however, something seems odd about the situation. I may either use an investigation check to go to 12, or an insight check to go to 46 to determine what's piquing my interest. Well, as an investigator, I think we must go to our investigation check. So to 12 we go. You are positive that there are details you're missing, so you turn your attention to what's happening around you. Roll an intelligence investigation check. We roll a 15. If we roll under a 10, go to 18. Higher, we go to 9. To 9 we go. Gain inspiration. That's our second point of inspiration. Um, something is I need to decide is whether or not I get to roll inspiration after a roll or if I have to choose beforehand. I like choosing beforehand. That way I can't roll terrible and be like, oh, I get a re-roll like a luck point. I want it to be something that is like, this is important, so I'm going to use inspiration. So that's the rule we'll set for this campaign. As Tomlin spoke, several young and even a few middle-aged women smiled and whispered to one another. Though no one seemed happy about the passing of this Maybelline, it seems that the attractive young women are less sad than others. It's clear that Tomlin is known for more than tinctures and decoctions here in Langston. He 
steps aside to allow a red-bearded dwarf, another brother of ours, the floor to address the crowd. So my man is attractive. The dwarf is dressed in hides and homespun cloth, while his hair and beard seem struggling to break free from the leather cords he's using to style them. He's clean now, but something in the dwarf's demeanor suggests this is his version of dressing up. Welcome, people of Langston, he says with a warm smile that makes his eyes sparkle. As sad as I am to see Maybelline return to the earth, I want to remind Langston to choose life. As you all know, I'm grateful my circle assigned me to Langston. There's a murmur of assent in the crowd and a few raised glasses, and you have all made it so easy for me. You've respected the forest and all of its inhabitants, and in return, I have been happy to act as both spiritual counsel and guiding hand for the forces of nature around you. I join you in grieving the loss of a wonderful member of this community and I hope you will join me in welcoming her back into the cycle of life. He mutters a spell as his hands begin to radiate a faint green glow, but he's interrupted by a sneezing fit, after which his beard and hair thicken and stand on end. He smooths his hair and regains his composure. Excuse me, he says with a deep growl in his voice. He clears his throat and completes his spell, causing a splash of extraordinarily bright wildflowers to bloom on the dais on which the casket rests. He nods his approval at his own work before returning to the crowd, raising a glass and smiling broadly to life he downs his drink along with others in the crowd but you're more interested in the strange reaction the local druid had to the sneezing fit you can try either an arcana go to 38 or perception go to 14 check to better understand what you've seen i'd say as an investigator we're less focused on the magic and more on what we see with our eyes perception it is the 14 we go you focus your senses on the bushy haired druid especially those odd changes that occurred during his sneezing fit roll a wisdom perception check if you get 10 or higher, go to 42. If you get less than 10, go to 10. All right, here's our second perception check. Hopefully it goes a little bit better than the first. Ooh, we barely get it with an 11. But, hey, that's enough. We now have three points of inspiration. The druid's face and nose seem unusually red, but the dwarf doesn't seem to be drunk. With the sneezing and the hoarse voice, it seems likely that he's feeling unwell. It doesn't seem to have affected his energy level, however. Whatever's affecting him clearly triggered some kind of change, however. Though it was incredibly quick, you did notice that as the druid sneezed, his ears and nose lengthened and even his build changed momentarily. To you, it looked more canine, almost wolf-like, for a split second. Before you can scrutinize the dwarf druid further, an adult human female in the white robes of a sun cleric and unassuming demeanor approaches the crowd. Go to page 39. Though you met her in the street, the young sun cleric seems like a different person behind the Podium. She speaks clearer and stands up straighter. She seems possessed of a confidence you didn't see from the same sweet, but a little scattered young woman you met on your way to the pickled hen. Most of you from town know me, but I see some unfamiliar faces, she says. I am Selene, a member of the Radiant Order and custodian of Langston's Eastern Temple. May the light guide you. Several people reflexively respond with, and you. They then make a salutation of the right hand touching the heart and then moving in an arc overhead, reminding you of a sun rising and setting overhead. Given the cleric's youth, it's obvious her order has a long history in this town. Though we are in the dark shadows cast by our loss, she continues, the sun will shine forever on Maybelline, as her presence was a bright shining light to all of us. I did not know Maybelline well in life, but it is clear that she has touched the lives of everyone here in this room. She looks directly at Tomlin and smiles kindly, and my heart goes out to you, especially Tomlin. Know that my door is always open to you. And then she leads the service in a hymn. She introduces as coming from the Rathakananar, Book of Funerary Rites. It seems that no one in the audience knows it, but she sings anyways in a high, sweet voice, and the crowd labors to keep up with her. As we guide the light with you and drive the shadows away, the radiant sword of your heart, the evil of darkness slay. Though you're gone from our sight, in our heart of hearts remain. Rest well in the light of the sun and the shield of our faith sustain. Though the cleric appears to be earnest and sincere, the difference between between the woman you met outside and the one standing before you now is start. You may opt to roll either a religion check or an insight check. We're definitely doing insight. We're going to go to 43. The cleric's role as a spiritual leader clashes with the shy demeanor she displayed earlier. So you consider what may actually be motivating her. Go ahead and roll an insight check. Let's do this. Ooh, we roll a natural 19. So we get a 25. So we pass with flying colors. So we're going to head over to 45. Selene seems distracted as she delivers her prayers. Her gaze drifts towards Tom Tomlin, as she speaks, often lingering longer than on any of the others in the crowd. And at least once, when she addresses him directly, the handsome herbalist face
place registers warmth, familiarity, and something else you can't quite figure out in that fleeting moment. There is a lot more to unpack in how she's speaking and acting, especially as it relates to the aggrieved fiancé, but it's only the slightest hint of what she might be going through beneath the veneer of a spiritual leader. The mayor looms behind Selene for a moment before the cleric notices and retreats from the front of the crowd. Go to 25. As Selene recedes into the background, the half-orc mayor stands rigid with her hands clasped behind her back. She cuts a powerful figure with her broad shoulders and battle scars, but she maintains an air of sophistication with a well-made suit in the noble style. An enormous mastiff pads up to her side and sits beside her, remaining equally still. Though her heritage stands out to you in the mostly human town of Langston, no one else seems to notice. Her buttercup, she says to the dog in a heavy accent. The mastiff immediately seats itself at her side. The mayor returns her attention to the crowd of attendees. Tanya Anathram was a soldier before she was your mayor. She begins laying a hand over her heart. Langston welcomed me and gave me a place to heal after the Battle of the Three Rivers. There I fought to defend the people from a barbarian horde, and I will protect the people of Langston. She looks out into the crowd, moving just her eyes as the rest of her remains perfectly still. Her huge dog could be a statue for all it moves. There is a killer out there in the darkness, she says, and her eyes lock on yours. We do not know what it is, but it took one of the citizens under my protection. We will find whatever took this life and end the threat. This is my promise to you. A ripple of soft applause and angry muttering sweeps through the crowd. The dog's head tracks both sounds for a moment before glancing at the mayor, returning to its vigil. She turns to address the family of the deceased. I am so sorry for your loss, she says, and then steps away from the casket and starts making her way through the crowd towards you. As she makes her way to where you're standing, you can make either a history check or an animal handling check. All right, so this is a history roll. It says, you think you remember the events of Tanya's story differently. Let's go ahead and roll. We got an 11, so we just barely made it, so that's good. We're gonna head over to 17. The mayor made some glaring mistakes in her account of the battle she said she participated in. The Battle of the Three Rivers was a coup by a neighboring kingdom, not barbarian hordes, and it was won by guerrilla tactics from the local peasantry who were the aggressors, not the victims. But it's unclear if she's lying or just wrong, so this probably isn't the best conversation starter as the mayor approaches. Go to 30. Some interesting intrigue from the mayor. You are an adventurer, yes? Yes, I am. That and an investigator. Then I suppose you will do for now. Between her rumbling orcish accent and deadpan delivery, it's impossible to tell what she actually thinks about you. But she does make a sweeping gesture towards the bar and then starts off. This stern woman is obviously not one for pleasantries. As you follow behind her, she stops to speak to an aproned balding man you can only assume is the innkeeper. And the town will pay the investigator's room and board. This is acceptable. The innkeeper cuts you a glance but nods. Their business concluded, Mayor Anatharam returns to you with a key to your room. You ask, so why would you hire me? I know your type, adventurer, investigator, mercenary, hero for hire, it doesn't matter what you call yourself. The people are scared and they need someone, so I am hiring you. And since you're an outsider, if you fail, it will not reflect badly on the town. You start to thank her, but she cuts you off. I do not yet know you, she says as she holds up a hand, and I may not get time to if this killer gets to you next. You're here for the people and for me. As long as you're inv investigating this young woman's murder, we will pay for your stay. You will come to the town hall tomorrow as tonight is not the time to discuss the details of this case sleep well. She nods once, though it's unclear whether that's a farewell or an agreement of some kind, and then returns to her duties reassuring the funeral goers. You remain standing dumbfounded for a moment as a figure breaks away from the crowd and moves towards you. It's Tomlin, the village herbalist and fiancé of the deceased. Hello, he says, his eyes are almost entrancing up so close. I haven't met you yet. How did you know, Maybelline? Oh, I, I don't. I just arrived to town today, but the, the mayor has recently asked me to participate in the investigation. He looks you over and nods as if you passed some sort of assessment. Welcome then. Thank you very much for doing this for us. Please come to my home for whatever you need. I want... No, I need to know what happened to my Maybelline. You bid the grieving man good night, and he gives you a smile that is dazzling despite its sadness. He moves on to speak to other guests, and you make your way to go to your room. Here we get the benefits of a long rest. You wake up in a soft bed to a hot breakfast cooling outside your door. This is much better living than camping by the road, so it's probably time to meet your benefactor. Inn's common room is a bustle of activity as quiet townspeople load flowers from the funeral into a wagon in front of the inn. The body of the deceased is already gone. After weaving your way through the workers, you find yourself outside, where passerby are deliberately ignoring the wagon full of blossoms. With the help of a few locals on the streets, you make your way to the town hall. The town hall is a multi-story building 
building, but not much larger than the surrounding structures. It isn't made of the same timber walls as the rest of the town, and is instead a much sturdier stone structure, so it likely predates the town's growth. The door stands open, and an aide greets you when you arrive. He shows you to the mayor in a large but simply appointed office in the back of the building. The room is dominated by a large dark stained wood desk, where Mayor Anatharam is working with a quill and ink pot. There is also an unlit hearth on one wall, and a couple of orderly bookshelves. There are no personal effects that you can see. A cushion and a bowl of water are set up next to the desk. The mayor's mastiff is lounging there, watching you intently as you enter. I can go greet the mayor, or I can pet the dog. I'm gonna greet the mayor. I wouldn't say I'm overly fond of dogs, especially after interacting with those wolves outside of town. You politely greet the mayor, and the dog lays its massive head back down on its paws. It continues to watch you closely, however. I am grateful for your service, she says. You assume she's being genuine, but it's impossible to tell for her sure with her stony delivery. She outlines the problem she's having, a gruesome murder about a week ago. The town militia is fine against bandits or sheep rustlers, but this requires someone different. The poor girl was mangled as if by a wild beast, but she was found within town. Besides, Roy keeps the wood free of monsters and supernatural hazards. And besides, she explains, you're an outsider and therefore expendable. It's the mayor's role to protect the town, not every drifter that wanders in. The town will pay 320 gold pieces to eliminate the threat. That fee is non-negotiable, and Mayor Anatharam gives you the impression it would be bad for your health to try. If you accept the job, go to 48. If you reject the job, go to 5. Ooh, I'm going to accept it, but I'm really curious what would happen if I rejected it. Excellent, Mayor Anatharam says in a gravelly tone. You can only assume means she's pleased. Let us us begin. Please speak to Maybelline's fiancé. He is an herbalist who lives in the western edge of town where he tends his garden and makes medicines for the townsfolk. You thank the mayor and prepare to leave, but she holds up a hand. I also made an arrangement with our general store. You may go to resupply anytime you may need to do so. It does not have as many goods as a big city, but it will likely have whatever you need. Much at a discount. And here is an advance to make whatever purchase you may need. Add 20 GP to our inventory. Thank you for the kind gesture. Mayor, I appreciate it. She grunts in response before returning to the paperwork on the table. And that is chapter one. So far we have a druid who is shape-shifting into an animalistic look accidentally by sneezing isn't feeling the best. We have a woman who was essentially mauled, like viciously torn apart by a beast. Then we have a, a cleric who is interested in the deceased's fiance. We then have a mayor who is lying about her involvement in a battle from the past. And those are kind of the main characters that are standing out along with the fiance of the deceased who is gorgeous apparently and is the attention of all of the lady folk. Now I am going to play through the rest of this campaign, but I'm not going to be doing it live because it would spoil it for the rest of you. So if you are wanting to see the rest of Wolves of Langston, you can go ahead and check it out in the description down below. And the same team who created the Wolves of Langston is doing a Kickstarter for another solo campaign called The Crystals of Zlesh. Where this one is more of a murder mystery story, that one is more of a survival story. So I like having the different story elements with each di different solo campaign. Now because this is a murder mystery solo campaign, I don't want to continue going forward and spoil the whole story for everyone involved. So if you want to continue The Wolves of Langston, you can find the link in the description down below. We got you a discount code so you can try it out for yourself. I'm pretty intrigued. I've never done a solo campaign before and this seems really well done. I like how it bounces from place to place so you don't get any spoilers and I like how it's non-linear. Usually when someone builds like a choose your own adventure, it feels like it's choose two or three and then three or five, you know, and I like how this one's bouncing you all over the place. It avoids spoilers. It makes it feel more intricate. Well, my friends, that is it for today's video. As always, I just want to say thank you so much for watching and for your support. We appreciate you guys so much and we'll catch you on the next one. See you then.